You are listening to Dispatch Radio, sponsored by theglobaldispatch.com. Welcome back to Dispatch Radio. Well, we're in Florida. It's summer. It's hot, and it's sweltering, and it's humid. And one of the things your kids are going to want to do is cool off. You have the option of going to one of our beautiful beaches or some of the beautiful lakes in central Florida. Um, Also, this time of year, health officials are always giving us a warning about the potential dangers of uh, swimming in these bodies of water. Uh, With us on the phone is Dr. Jennifer Cope. She's a medical epidemiologist with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and she's here to discuss with us um, the cause of parasitic meningitis, Neglaria fowleri. Uh, hello, Jennifer, and welcome to the show. Hi, good morning. Thanks for having me. Great. Um, can you just start out for our listeners and give us a brief description of what Neglaria fowleri is? Sure. Um, Neglaria fowleri is a free-living amoeba. Amoebas are uh, single-celled microscopic organisms. Um, and the free living part means uh, kind of differentiates it from um, other types of parasites that have to live in some type of host, whether that's a human host or an animal host. Um, Nigleria phalari is free living, mean it, meaning it can um, exist in the environment, in, in the water and soil without having to have any type of host. Right. And this amoebic infection is really pretty rare in the United States and around the world, as a matter of fact. Uh, we've had about 30 odd cases reported in the past decade. However, it's typically seen during the warm summer months and usually in the southern tier states like Florida. Why is this? Well, um, as you know, I started describing the amoeba. It, it, the other thing I should have mentioned is that it, it's thermophilic, which means it's heat loving. And so um, it's typically found in warm, fresh water, um, such as lakes, rivers, and streams. Um, and so the, the predominance in the southern tier states um, is, is likely because of the warmer weather and the warmer, uh, waters, uh, warmer bodies of water that are in those states. Okay, and, and the, the disease is technically called primary amoebic meningoencephalitis. Uh, how does uh, one contract this amoeba? Well, uh, we think um, that the, the main way that people uh, get this infection is by um, swimming in these uh, warm bodies of fresh water. Um, the amoeba uh, will then uh, go up the nose, um, and, and the nose has uh, proximity to the brain. So the amoeba goes up into the nasal cavity and then um, crosses into the brain um, by that route. Um, and so the main, the main way that people get this infection in the United States is, is through recreational freshwater use. Um, there has been uh, some cases that have been associated with neti pot use as well. Um, and, and, you know, for those, uh, neti pot use has become very common, so most people probably know what that is now, but um, it's become very popular for treating uh, sinus conditions. Um, and that's where a saline solution is often uh, is made with water and, and put into the nose to, to treat sinus conditions. Right. And now the symptoms of PAM, um, are very similar to bacterial meningitis. So my, my question for you is, if you take your child to the ER and they have these symptoms, what's to keep them from treating the child incorrectly with uh, antibiotics for Neisseria or Haemophilus or something like that? Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, that's correct. The symptoms are almost exactly the same as bacterial meningitis. And, and what, you know, if you take your child into the ER and they have those type of symptoms, what, what often happens and what should happen is that they'll have um, a spinal tap done. And that, that is definitely the first thing that needs to be done um, in Nigleria or PAM infections as well. Um, and so, you know, what, what needs to probably happen, um, particularly in, in areas in, in places like Florida and other southern states where these infections are, are um, a, you know, tend to happen more, um, is you, you need to be talking with the patient and with their parents about um, what they might have been doing in the past couple, you know, in the past week or so. And, it, and you know, if, if they're looking um, and, and things just aren't checking out as bacterial meningitis, they're not seeing the bacteria when they look at the uh, spinal fluid, um, and then they, also, they hear that, the, the, yes, the, the child's been swimming a lot lately in, in, a, in warm freshwater lakes, then that, that should really prompt the physician to think maybe a little bit outside the box of just bacterial meningitis and think about Nigleria. 
Um, the, the amoeba is often seen in the spinal fluid. When you look under the microscope, the, the amoeba, um, the trophozoite form is seen in the spinal fluid and it's mobile, so you can see it moving um, under the microscope in the, in the spinal fluid. And so just so, little clues like that, being, um, being the astute physician is what we like to, to say, um, uh, can really make the difference between um, getting, you know, getting treatment started, the appropriate treatment started uh, uh, rapidly. Yeah, great advice. And uh, concerning the treatment, this is the question I was most interested in. Uh, the treatment is uh, mostly um, unsatisfactory for this disease. And uh, last, num last November, I did an interview with... Um, Julie Lewis, uh, you may know her, um, Jennifer. She's the mother of Kyle Lewis and the co-founder of the Kyle Lewis Amoeba Awareness Foundation. Mm -hmm. And she said that one of, the, one of the objectives of the foundation is to get an effective treatment for neglaria. She mm -hmm. said there is research being done in California on a drug that is showing good promise in treatment. So my question for you, Jennifer, is are there any good drugs in the pipeline to treat this parasite? Well, you know, one of the most exciting things that, that just happened um, for us at CDC is we've been able to um, obtain a, an investigational new drug protocol from FDA to bring um, an, a drug that's still unlicensed in the U.S., um, uh, but we've been under this IND, been able to bring it here, um, obtain it, and key and store it at CDC at our headquarters in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and we now have this drug. It's it's shown some promise in treating some other free living amoeba infections. Um, and we haven't had a good chance to use it um, for Nigleria infections, mainly because it was it was manufactured overseas, and and each time we wanted to use it, um, it required a lot of paperwork and bringing it over um, from overseas. Season, so that would often take much longer than Nigleria infection. Nigleria patients tend to live, and so um, this now allows us to keep it, as I said, in Atlanta, Georgia. And we do encourage physicians to, if they suspect a Nigleria infection, to co contact us um, as soon as they suspect that, so that we can consult with them and potentially um, send uh, send this drug uh, rapidly out to them. Sure. And um, what's the name of that, Jennifer? That drug is called miltefacine, um, and the drug that I believe uh, Julie Lewis was referring to is another drug that's um, in a much earlier stages of testing. Again, another un unlicensed drug as well, sure. but CDC does intend to explore avenues of, of using that drug uh, potentially in the future as well. Okay, great. And uh, let's close this segment, um, Jennifer, with this. Um, tell the parents of our listening audience uh, What's the most important thing they can do to prevent this infection in their children? Well, I think the most important thing they can do is, is just, first of all, be aware of this infection. Uh, we certainly don't, you know, we don't want to recommend that people not go swimming at all. It's a, it's a healthy and fun activity. Some of the things that can be done include uh, holding the nose shut, using nose clips, or keeping the head above water when you take part in, in water-related activities in, the, in bodies of warm, fresh water. Um, avoid putting your head under the water in hot springs and other untreated thermal waters. Uh, avoid water-related activities in warm fresh water during periods of high water temperature and low water levels. So during those, um, you know, those times of drought and, and, and heat waves, uh, you know, those times where you really want to go in the water, it might be best to, to avoid those warm fresh water areas. And then avoid digging in or stirring up the sediment when you take part in water-related activities in uh, shallow warm fresh water areas. Great. Uh, we have been talking to medical epidemiologists with the CDC, Dr. Jennifer Cope. Uh, thank you for lending your expertise, uh, and thanks uh, for coming on the program, and have a nice weekend. Thank you. You too. Bye, Jen. All right. Brandon, uh, just a, a little follow-up on that. We, the GlobalDispatch.com has been covering a case um, in Arkansas right now. It's been confirmed by uh, the Arkansas Department of Public Health and the CDC of a supposedly a child that has got this infection and uh, so you can see that on the globaldispatch.com brandon well i tell you you know we hear a lot of the uh you know brain eating bacteria stuff make headlines and that kind of thing so it was great to have her put some uh, real life spin on this prevention talk about it in real life obviously not having the scare tactics of trying to scare people out of uh swimming all the time but more practical uh, prevention and education so uh we're